Hello again, class. All right, this short uh, lecture is intended for Philosophy Through Film, Phil 110, but it's also quite relevant for Philosophy 202 because we're, we're using the same philosopher in both courses. It's just in Philosophy 202, we're considering how um, the philosophy pertains to human nature and Phil 110, we're relating it to the film, <clears throat> The Wizard of Oz. So I'm going back and forth between uh, for Phil 110 classes, philosophy through film. I'm going back and forth between Nietzsche and Lao Tzu. So Nietzsche, we're relating to the film Alice in Wonderland, and Lao Tzu, we're relating to um, The Wizard of Oz. So I'd like to go over a chapter with you and relate it, uh, give you some hints on how you might relate it to um, the film The Wizard of Oz. But for you students in Phil 202, um, if you want to entertain yourself and understand the philosophy of Lao Tzu better, it would be nice to um, take this time um, to watch the film The Wizard of Oz once again from a Taoist standpoint. But you don't have to do that. The things I'm saying now um, pertain to Lao Tzu and uh, it, it will help you to understand Taoist philosophy and the human nature involved in that. So I'd like to go over chapter uh, 67, LXVII. It's on page 225 of um, Arthur Whaley's translation of the Tao Te Ching of Lao Tzu. He translated, the, the name of that book is called The Way and Its Power. It's a translation of the Tao Te Ching. Okay, so um, the, the chapter starts with, Everyone under heaven says that our way, our Tao, remember I told you every time you see the, the word way, the capital W, it's a translation of the word Tao. Everyone under heaven says that our Tao, our way, is greatly like folly, but it is just because it is great that it seems like folly. As for things that do not seem like folly, well, there could be no question about their smallness. So what could that mean? Let's just look at that sentence. Well, what he's saying is that from the ordinary way of being in the world, the, the way of being in the world, the thoughtless, mindless way of being in the world, the everyday way of being in the world, um, the way of being in the world without a brain, um, to try to think about how you might attune yourself and become aware of attunement with the ultimate source of things, namely Tao, and become aware of how all things are pouring forth from the Tao in the way that we spoke of last time. That seems like a waste of time. I mean, after all, we got more important things to think about, right? Especially now, than attunement with the source. So from the ordinary point of view, it looks like folly. You're wasting your time thinking about ultimate realities and attuning yourself with the source. What a waste. But it is just because it's great that it seems like folly. So the greatness is something that is not ascertainable from the ordinary way of being in the world. We're unable to revere what's revereable because of our way of being in the world, our mindless, thoughtless, brainless way of being in the world. As for things that do not seem like folly, what kind of things? The acquisition of wealth, uh, external power over others, um, physical pleasures, uh, accumulating material things putting others down in order to put yourself up. All those things, they don't seem like folly. That's what everyone is doing for the most part. Well, he says, there can be no question about their smallness. So he's talking about a topsy-turvy world. What's central to life is put on the periphery. What's peripheral to life is made central. So what Lao Tzu is suggesting is that perhaps we should 
take what's central and recognize it as central. And what's peripheral, put it on the periphery. So let's set the world right side up. He's talking about an inverted world. So that's the meaning of that first sentence. The next line is a key theme in Taoist philosophy. Lao Tzu says, I have three treasures, three great treasures. Guard and keep them. So what are these three treasures? Well, the text says the first is pity, the second is frugality, the third is refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. Well, I told you years ago when I was practicing Tai Chi with great Taoist master, Master Hong in Coventry in Cleveland, we were translating the Tao Te Ching together and he has a master's degree in Chinese literature. Although his English wasn't that good, my English was a lot better and I had some understanding of Taoism, but he was the great Taoist master. So I thought together we can translate this book. We did about 13 chapters before he passed away. And this is one of the chapters we translated together. So I asked him, because I've always had some skepticism about the word pity. I never thought pity was a good thing. People don't want to be pitied and it's not pleasurable uh, to, to pity anyone. So we, he went in his back room and he dug out the Tao Te Ching in Chinese and he brought it, he's, oh, not pity, he says, not pity. I said, well, what's a better translation? And he didn't know the better translation because he didn't have that great of a vocabulary in English. But he started describing the Chinese character for me. He said, it's like loving somebody, but great love, love everyone, love life. So I said, okay, let's translate pity into great love. That's better. Okay, so let's change that word then. By the way, Arthur Whaley knows Chinese. I don't know Chinese, but I do feel the right to uh, come up with a better word here and there, especially if I ran it by somebody like Master Hong. So, okay, so the first treasure is great love. Okay, the second is frugality. Again, I had some skepticism about that word, so I asked Master Hong. He said, what frugality is? I said, well, usually Master Hong, frugality is like, learning how to spend your money properly. Don't waste your money and be frugal. Just buy what you need. No, not about buying things, he said. It's about living simple life. I said, okay, well then let's, let's translate it because frugality is usually used in the context of, of money and lots of it means something larger than that. So it's not frugality. A better word would be simplicity. So let's make the second treasure be simplicity. Actually, we're not making it that. I just think it's a better translation. The third, we can leave it as it is, he said. Refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. Refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. So refusing to scramble, to be on top, the refusal to put others down, to get, make yourself powerful. The refusal to push things in order to make them accord with your intentions, pushing things to make things happen your way. Okay, so we have these three treasures now. Great love, simplicity, and refusal to be foremost of all things under heaven. Not scrambling to get on top. Being like water, going down. And then the next line builds, the next passage builds on that. It is only he that pities, but we, we changed that word, right? For only he who possesses great love is truly able to be brave, courageous. Only he that is frugal is able to be profuse, truly profuse, he says. So we changed the word, right, from frugal to simplicity. Only he who lives simply is truly able to be profuse. Do you know the word profuse? Maybe not. Profuse means being able to give, not because you're trying to be altruistic or gain favors in heaven, but out of overfulness. I have too much, so I give. To be a giver, not a taker. 
to be overfull and overflowing and giving out of overfullness. Only he who is lives simply is able to be truly profuse. My grandmother used to tell me there are two kinds of people in this world, givers and takers. So make your friends givers and be a giver. So that same idea is in Lao Tzu. But, and then he that refuses to be foremost of all things under heaven becomes chief of all ministries. That's a metaphor. That means ruler, leader, great leader. So let's think more deeply about those three lines. Only he that possesses great love is capable of becoming courageous. Only he who, who lives simply is able to be profuse. Only he that refuses to be foremost of all things under heaven is truly becomes chief of all ministers. That is a great leader. So how is it that great love leads to bravery? Well, think of any brave action you've ever considered. The motive was out of love, great love. Not just love for this or that person, for yourself or your loved ones, but for something greater than that out of love for life itself. Only he who is, lives simply is truly to be profuse. What can we make of that? Whatever is empty will be filled. It's a divine law. It's, you see that idea in many religions. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What else could that mean? So Jesus was a Taoist without even studying Taoism. The ideas come together, right? But the same idea we find in all profound reflections on life. Um, even on a literal level, if you're frugal, if, you're, if you live simply, then you have more to give, right? Because you're not spending it all on yourself. But there's a deeper uh, spiritual meaning there. Whatever's empty will be filled. Remember I, to I told you in Taoist philosophy, there's an emphasis on yin, on emptiness, on receptivity, on openness, on listening. Think about it. If you want to hear someone speak, you have to be quiet, right? And even inside your mind, you have to still your mind if you're going to listen to them. Not enough just to not be talking. You have to be empty inside, and then you can hear what they're saying. Same thing. Whatever's empty will be filled. So he who is simple, can be profuse. He who refuses to be foremost of all things under heaven becomes ruler of the world. So Tao is like a current. It's a source of everything. It's the way that gives always, but it's also a current that runs through everything. It's like a wave in the ocean. And if you've ever tried to body surf or surf, if you get in front of the wave, you get clobbered by the wave. You get behind the wave, you just miss the wave. You don't get carried by the wave. So the idea, all surfers know this. They know it in their bodies. Um, you want to get right on the crest of the wave, not too much above it, not behind it, just right there. And then it carries you. And you can ride it all the way in. It's a great thrill. So in the same way, there's this current running through life. The universe is pushing towards a particular way. And one can attune oneself with that. And one receives da, like the power of the waves. Only this is the power of the universe. <clears throat> so that idea is called wu wei. Remember I told you wu means nothing. Wei means action. Through no action, by not pushing things too far, and by not getting behind it, then one can receive the power of the universe, namely da, like the power of the waves. Only it's not just the waves, it is the waves too. But beyond that, the power of the universe, things fall in place in a magical way. And one enters as some athletes speak of, or musicians, they enter the zone. 
there's a zone where people who are really adept at doing something, they can go there at will. And then they release themselves and something else takes over, but not before long practice in that. So that's what that means. At present, he says, your bravery is not based on pity. We changed the word pity, remember, to great passion. Nor your profusion is not based on frugality, or we change it to simplicity. But great love cannot fight without conquering or guard without saving. Heaven arms with pity, we changed it to great love. Heaven arms with great love those whom it would not see destroyed. So if you possess great love, then you have no death spots, as Lao Tzu calls it. That things in a strange kind of way, uh, you're sort of surrounded by a kind of innocence where you become invulnerable to the threats that normally threaten people who are excessive or pushing things too much. There's like an invisible shield around you. It's not some new agey kind of hocus pocus. It just means that uh, heaven arms with great love those whom it would not see destroyed. So through great love, one becomes invulnerable to threats that threaten to destroy others. Now, how can all this be related to the film? Well, I don't want to make the connections for you, but Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz has three companions. And these three companions are really part of her dream. They're people from live on the farm, and, but at the same time, the dream work makes them into these characters. So you have the cowardly lion, you have the tin man, and you have the scarecrow. But these are three aspects of Dorothy. She feels like a cowardly lion. She's a little girl in a hostile world with a nasty lady wanting to take Toto. And she's upset, but she feels threatened. She feels like a cowardly lion. So when she dreams, she meets the cowardly lion. Think about it, that's a contradiction, right? A lion is the king of the jungle, but this lion is cowardly. Then she meets a scarecrow. He has no brain. This is Dorothy. She feels naive, stupid. She can't figure things out. And then she meets the tin man. He doesn't have a heart. So these are three aspects of her psyche. Now, when you watch the film, you see that as it unfolds, the cowardly lion becomes the most courageous person. The tin man has great compassion, great love. And the scarecrow, he figures everything out. So she had a brain all along. She had great love all along. And so through great love, the cowardly lion becomes a courageous lion. And by putting her mind on the way, following the yellow brick road, she realizes she has a brain, a great one. And when she returns, she finds that she has great love, not just love for Toto and herself, but love of life itself. So think about how these um, three treasures might be related to Dorothy's three companions. But for the other class, well, there's one more thing I wanna say before we go. The transformation from great love to courage and 
so on, the three transformations that he talks about, from simplicity to profuse, and from not trying to be foremost of all things to becoming leader of the world, that takes place through Wu Wei. It's an awareness that Dorothy realizes she's had these things all along. The cowardly lion was courageous. So it wasn't some uh, deliberate thing on her part. It happened through Wu Wei. So those are some hints for a connection. And those are the three treasures of Taoism. So read chapter uh, 67 on page 225. And for you students of human nature, think about how humans are capable of possessing and guarding those three treasures and why they're so valuable to humans. All right, so that's a Taoist view of Dorothy's three companions. <laughs>